Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Taylor Ricketts. I'm a professor here and the director of the Gun Institute for Environment uh, here at UVM. And it's a great pleasure to stand up and introduce and welcome uh, Steve Pulaski here for his fifth visit in five and six years as a Marsh professor. So the sort of standard basics first, Steve is the Fessler Lambert Chair and a Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, he has an amazing job title of eco Ecological Slash Environmental Economist. So for economics, so for economists that are aware of that divide, he is literally bridging it in his job title. He's also appointed in both the ecology and the applied economics departments um, at Minnesota. So that tells you right away the sort of interdisciplinary bridge bridging nature of his work and as the way the way he approaches science. Um, he's you know a fellow of everything, AAAS, the big economic societies, he's a member of the National Academy, he's a crazy productive guy. Um, and he is one of the leaders in ecosystem services and trying to really, really understand how we're delivered biophysically, what they're worth economically in dollar and many other kinds of terms. Um, he's also, especially for an economist, a very practical guy um, who really tries to solve problems instead of, um, well, lots of other things that tend to occupy lots of other economists. So um, he's a joy for me and lots of other people from the ecological side to work with. Um, so Steve's been really committed to this Marsh professorship too, and I just want to give him a shout out for that. Like I said, he's been here five years out of six. Um, spends a week each time, each fall, goes a lot to classes, has lunch with students all the time, um, gives these talks. We also figure out a research project to do every year and try to kind of sketch it out from front to back in the course of the week, and then clean it up over the ensuing year or two. So out of his previous four visits, all four have become sort of completed research projects. Two of them published already, two of them about to be. So the, um, that part's been actually quite productive. He's also been willing to um, go for hikes all over the place. He's uh, stayed at people's houses and in, in addition to hotels, he's dressed up in my daughter's Halloween costumes. He's given a talk in her Wonder Woman costume because one of his talks fell on Halloween itself. So he's just kind of game for everything, being here and kind of diving into it, which I really appreciate. He's a great pleasure to collaborate with, really, really nice guy, a good role model for me to how to be a productive, influential scientist and still be really nice and generous and calm about life. So uh, it's great to have him here repeatedly, and I hope even though his March term is expiring, we'll get him back. So this time he's going to talk about uh, valuing and conserving natural capital in China and the U.S., both places he spent a lot of time doing research and advising governments on how to do this stuff. So, Steve Pulaski. Great. Thanks, Paul. So, thanks. It's a it's always a great pleasure to come. And um, uh, although I have to say, you know, the hiking bit. So, I think it was two years ago or three years ago. Um, my wife was here and we decided to go hiking and we went, it was Camelback and it's a nice gentle trail going up one side and it was a beautiful day and we got close to the top and we saw this like winter weather cut off. It's like, huh, I wonder why you need that. And then the clouds came in and it started icing and then we went down the other side, which is sheer rock. So anyway, I'm still here. But uh, I wish the Wonder Woman would have come in useful then. Anyway, OK, it's, it is a great pleasure to come to Vermont and to work with Taylor and others at the, at the Gund Institute. Um, I feel like I'm among friends when I come. Um, and uh, so anyway, today I want to talk about uh, um, examples of, of thinking about conserving natural capital, so valuing and conserving natural capital and ecosystem services in both China and the US. So I've been going to China since 2011. I've been going there two or three times a year, working with a very uh, wonderful set of colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So I'll, 
I'll talk more um, about that um, as I go. And um, well, let me just plunge in. So a lot of this work, like how I got to China in the first place, is uh, through the Natural Capital Project, which um, Taylor is one of the co-founders of, along uh, with myself and Gretchen Daly and Peter Kariva. So initially, the four partners of the Natural Capital Project were the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Stanford, and Minnesota. Um, and when we we worked basically, you know, we wanted to be global, so it wasn't just a U.S.-centric uh, project, but we have done a lot of work in the U.S., and I'm, I'm going to talk about some of that, the lessons we've learned. So we've worked, I lived in Oregon before moving to Minnesota, so there's a lot of the early work in the project was kind of based in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, we did work in Minnesota. We've done work, especially with Gretchen and her crew in Hawaii. Um, so I'll talk a bit about some of the work and some of the lessons we've, we've had in the, in the U.S. In the last year, we have invited the Chinese Academy of Sciences to be um, a full partner in the Natural Capital Project. And, and this is really a recognition of the great work that, that we have been doing in partnership with them for a, a number of years. And so I'll talk also about some of the work on ecosystem services and natural capital um, in China. It's been fascinating personally and I think really rewarding also professionally. Um, so I want to start off, I, I think most people in this room actually are fairly convinced of the importance of what nature does for us humanity, uh, but thinking about the importance of natural capital um, and ecosystem services. And, and is it clear, when, when I say natural capital, I basically mean you know, the stocks of things, so things like the stock of fish or forests or uh, land, um, the things that endure through time. And ecosystem services are the flows of values that come from this. So if we harvest the fish, or if we sequester carbon in grasslands or forests. Um, so there's a close relationship, obviously, between natural capital and ecosystem services. Natural capital are the kind of assets of nature that produce the flow of ecosystem services. Um, and there is a wide array of, quote, goods and services, speaking in economic terms, basically things of value that, that nature provides uh, for us. And that's what we call these ecosystem services. Now, the problem, of course, is that people are changing the world rapidly, often in unintended ways, and that that's affecting ecosystems and these quote, natural capital assets in ways that are detrimental many times to the provision of ecosystem services. So I'm going to provide you two very quick examples um, one actually came, I was reading the New York Times online yesterday, and this example kind of jumped out at me. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this from, from yesterday's, literally yesterday's paper. So along the North Car North, Northern California coast, there are kelp forests. Um, with climate change, uh, there has been a, a warming of the water, and particularly they call it a blob of warm water, uh, it's suppressed upwelling. Um, off the coast. The warm water has triggered a decline in uh, starfish in the, the middle there. Uh, starfish and sea otters are predators on sea urchins. And on the left, there's a, a larger one, which is a red urchin, which is actually a, a prized catch uh, um, for sushi. But then there's the smaller purple urchins. And the purple urchin population has just exploded off the off the coast. Um, and it's basically like what would happen. So in our part of the world, if we had an explosion of deer because no, there were no longer any predators, they basically eat their way through the vegetation. And so the, the picture on the right is, uh, is um, what used to be uh, kelp forest and other um, aqua, you know, marine vegetation down there that has been eaten through basically by the uh, purple urchins. So there's, this is a picture that was in yesterday's paper. So back a few years ago, you see the extent of the kelp forests in green off the coast. And on the right is the current extent of the kelp forest. Just a dramatic change in a very short amount of time. 
Okay, that's obviously important if you're, if you're thinking about ecology, marine ecology, but it also has consequences for the people uh, living there. First of all, um, the, there is a commercial red urchin fishery, and as you see, it's, it's basically collapsing um, over this time period. Don't have the 2018 figures, but I think they're even less since this is making the New York Times now. Um, and this year they closed the recreational fishery for abalone. And this is an area where abalone fishery had, uh, recreational fishery had been uh, quite well established and brought in quite a number of, of people and revenue for the local community. So this is a case where, you know, a rapid um, ecological change is causing not only upset in the ecosystem, but um, in the human systems that depend upon um, those ecosystems. Okay, so the second example is a little bit uh, more facetious, but uh, has an important point. So if you could choose any planet in the solar system, which one would you choose? Well, many people choose this insignificant third one out from the sun uh, called Earth, so I thought we might think about the advantages of Earth relative to, let's say, Mars. Um, and, you know, if any of you have seen The Martian, you know, it's a pretty tough place to, to live, and he only really survives because of the things that he brought with him from Earth, uh, you know, including potatoes. Um, I really don't like to think about eating potatoes constantly for however long he had to do, but so anyway, let's just go through the checklist. You know, habitable temperature, breathable atmosphere, available water, available food supply, good restaurants and bars. Okay, you know, all of these tend to see that we should be living on Earth and not on on Mars. And though this is facetious, there really is a point here, right? I mean, it is the biosphere which supports and makes our life possible. Um, and we're doing things now to this biosphere that threaten that, not only kind of the, you know, abalone fishery, but really our, our basic life support system. And, you know, most of you all know about the rapid rise in population. We're currently 7.6 billion, estimates of 9 to 10 billion in uh, 2050. Uh, global GDP doubled between 1990 and 2015. And in China, this is just staggering. So it went from 361 billion of, of GDP in China in 1990 to 10.5 trillion in 2015, just in kind of a, a generation, you know, 28 fold increase in uh, the size of the economy. Even though it's slowing down this week, I mean, we're still talking about very, very rapid rates um, of growth. So what happens in China, and China's not alone, what's happening in India, what's happening in uh, various parts of the world, we're just big relative to the planet. And that has consequences, obviously. So uh, reports of people who have studied kind of global trends in natural capital and ecosystems and in biodiversity, ecosystem services and biodiversity, have, have all shown uh, a, a massive decline in, in many of the services. Um, so I'll just report one. This is getting a little bit dated. Um, I and a, a large number of people are now working on kind of a follow-up to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was published in 2005. So there's a thing called the Intergovernmental uh, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES. Sounds like you've got the hiccups, but that's what it is. Um, so IPBES is trying to basically uh, be like the IPCC, but for biodiversity and ecosystem services, do repeated uh, assessments of what are the status and trends in ecosystems and biodiversity. But anyway, the Millennium Ecos the report, I would love to use it. Um, it's part of it's sitting on my computer. It needs to be off my computer shortly, but it's not done yet, so I can't use it. But anyway, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment did a very useful thing, which they said, here are the, here are the trends in ecosystem services from 1950 to 2000, so 50-year period, kind of global trends. And most of the arrows, the, the triangles, are pointing downward. So the majority of ecosystem services are declining over this time period. At the same time that, you know, material goods, the economy is growing greatly, but 
These are declining. We're not paying attention to preserving the natural capital on which many of the important things we depend on, uh, you know, require. Um, but it's really interesting if you, for, especially for an economist looking at this. So I circled the ones that are going up and the ones that are going up, so there's kind of one exception, the, the, um, the carbon, but the other ones are, are very explainable. Why are they going up when almost everything else is declining? These are going up because these are things like crop production, uh, you know, animal husbandry, aquaculture. These are things that people get paid for. So there's an incentive for them to continue to provide the services, to continue to provide the natural capital that's necessary to produce those services. And in many cases, you know, we're, we're growing the, or we're expanding the amount of agricultural land and, and reducing the amount of forests and grasslands in order to do this. So that, you know, these are related. The, the rise in basically food production is related to the decline in many other services, water quality, carbon sequestration, and so forth. So, I mean, that leads me to think about this notion of you get what you pay for and you don't get what you don't pay for. So right now, most of natural capital, most ecosystem services are invisible to most important public and private decisions, and we see the result. I mean, in some sense, this should not be a surprise. Okay, so how do we try to correct that? That's the essence of really what the Natural Capital Project and many other groups are trying to do. You know, we're trying to get the values of nature for humanity back into the set, uh, you know, in, factored into important decisions that affect ecosystems. Um, can we correct this asymmetry? So farmers get paid for producing crops, they don't get paid for producing clean water or habitat or sequestering carbon, with, with exceptions. But for the most part, most of these ecosystem services, there is no incentive for people to provide them. And this distortion is, is increasingly becoming harmful. I mean, we see this in the climate news, so many of you are familiar with the IPCC report, but you know, the dead zones around the world, the loss of habitat, I know Taylor cares about the pollinators, the loss, I mean, you go, list goes on and on, the things that we are losing because we are not paying attention to them and not giving them proper credit. So one way of saying this is, you know, there's kind of an old adage in management, if you don't measure it or if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you don't value it, you won't sustain it. That's a lesson that I take from our recent past. Okay, well, very briefly, there, is, there are a number of ways that we can correct that. And this is um, work that uh, friends of Taylor's and mine, uh, Jim Salzman, uh, recently published, he calls them the five P's. It's kind of a nice alliteration, but you know we can we can basically have prescriptive uh, rules, the laws and regulations. You know you, you can't cut down that forest; it's zoned to be uh, kept a forest. We can have penalties if you do cut down the forest. We could have payments, payments for ecosystem services to preserve the forest. Uh, we could have property rights, so uh, establish um, uh, you know, some one owner of the forest, and maybe that gives them the incentives to preserve the forest. Or we could use persuasion. Please don't cut down the forest. Okay, various things have been tried in various combinations. Uh, so there are a number of government programs, both in the United States and China. Uh, Conservation Reserve Program, which I'll talk about briefly uh, later on. Uh, sloping lands conversion program and many others uh, in China. These are examples where you know we're trying to provide payments, we're trying to provide incentives for actions taken by landowners or farmers to uh, do things to maintain natural capital and the continued flow of ecosystem services. There's activity in the private sector. So I've been on the board of the Nature Conservancy uh, for the last nine years and um, they had a partnership with Dow Chemical. Uh, you can see here, working together to value nature. So Dow has been trying to come up with ways of valuing nature and bringing that into its operations. Unilever has been trying to push for using sustainable agriculture in their supply chain, and another number of other companies are, are, are doing various things. Um, there are commodity certifications, so 
um, forest certification, you know, FSC. There's the um, ISO um, 14,000 series that tries to provide standards. There are a number of commodity roundtables, soybeans and sugar, von sucro, uh, seafood. So there are a number of places where people have said we're going to uh, certify producers who are doing sustainable production. Um, one specific example um, in the area of water provision is what are called water funds. And some of you, I'm sure, are aware of what water funds are. They're, they're payments from downstream beneficiaries of clean water to upstream providers of water. And uh, this actually started in New York City and New York City going up to farmers and landowners in the Catskills and saying, you know, we will pay for practices that you know, move cattle away from streams, preserve buffers along uh, streams and reservoirs. But it, it took off in Latin America. And there are now, uh, I think it's 30 to 40 water funds in Latin America, which are organized on this principle of downstream beneficiaries paying upstream providers uh, to provide clean water. OK, so there are a number of tools out there now um, uh, to try to make the link between human actions and what happens in ecosystems and ultimately what happens to us and also on the incentive side like the policy how, how do we how do we provide incentives how do we correct this asymmetry between marketed goods and and ecosystem services for which oftentimes there is no payment so i want to take these kind of general statements and general uh, comments down to some specific examples um, in work that uh, i and colleagues have done um, over the past few years uh, in china and in the in the us i'm going to start with the us um, and some of the work here but uh, i'm going to spend a bit more time um, actually on the chinese examples because they're really interesting and i think it's we're more familiar generally um, uh, with most, mostly off, I see some people who look like they are maybe grew up in China, so you probably know more about China, but most of the people in the audience, I think, are more familiar with the, the U.S. examples. So um, first of all, why, why focus on China and the U.S.? Well, I mean, I think they're both really interesting cases, but they are, you know, in terms of superlatives, they are the two largest in terms of their economies, in terms of how much they export to the rest of the world, in terms of how much they import from the rest of the world, in terms of agricultural production, in terms of greenhouse gas. I mean, almost any activity that you think of that affects ecosystems and nature, China and the US are one and two, um, sometimes flipped, right? Um, so what happens in China and what happens in the US? Uh, is important, important for those countries, obviously, but also important for the world. And this uh, was really brought home to me two years ago at a, a, a natural capital project symposium. Um, and uh, we brought in a large delegation of Chinese um, who were there. And uh, they were very popular, and they were very popular with some delegations from Sub-Saharan Africa. For example, we had a group from Mozambique, and the Mozambicans really wanted to have a meeting with the Chinese because they said, we hear what you are doing with your programs to monitor natural capital in China. We want to do something similar. Right? So you know, we often think of you know, China's impact in terms of like what they're importing from Africa or how they're building roads, but also as a increasingly as a thought leader, countries are looking to China. So um, anyway, I think both countries are interesting. So anyway, I'm going to start though with the, with uh, the U.S. So thinking about conserving natural capital ecosystem services here, we have a very long tradition in the in the U.S. Uh, you know, clearly going back um, into the 1800s. I'll start with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, at the turn of the 19th, you know, the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s. You can see the quote here. I've done work on, on something called inclusive wealth, which is trying to look at giving to the next generations a set of wealth or assets that are at least as large as what we gave. You know, so, so doing better for the next generation than, than we started with. 
And here he is over 100 years ago basically saying that same thing, right? Um, we have a long tradition of uh, government actions to try to conserve. So I've listed some, not all, of the kind of important uh, conservation acts. And again, going back into the um, 1800s, so the first world's first national park, Yellowstone, uh, back in 1872, uh, on up. And you can see, you know, kind of this around the, the flowering of the environmental movement around 1970. You know, so in the 60s, you had the Wilderness Act and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Coastal Zone Management Act and the Endangered Species Act, all in that short uh, kind of burst of environmental activity. And of course, that's the found formation of EPA and the Clean Water and Clean Air Act uh, about that time. We're still living with the legacy of that time period, right? There have been very few new environmental pieces of legislation and looking at the current Congress and the current administration, I would not expect anything anytime soon. You know, most of the environmental groups, our conservation groups are desperately playing defense. How do we keep these things still being vital and still protecting natural capital today? Um, even so, there are a large range of programs. So this is just from, um, you know, Department of Agriculture and uh, Natural, uh, Natural Conservation um, uh, Research uh, Agency, you know, like Service, NRCS. Um, and you can see, I mean, there's just a, you know, it's kind of bewildering almost the, uh, the number of programs. However, if you look at how these programs are funded, Right, so we see a falling uh, standard in, you know, the, the falling, uh, this is enrollment in the Conservation Reserve Program, one of the largest. And uh, it has been steadily declining, even, even prior to the current administration. Okay, I'm going to get off of policy and talk about uh, some modeling and results. So this is a, a paper that came out in uh, Proceeds National Academy of Sciences a few years ago. Josh Lawler from the University of Washington is the lead author. Um, had a large team of ecologists and economists and geographers and others. Uh, basically, what we were trying to do is we we're trying to project ahead. So thinking where we are, where we were at the turn of the century and where we might go to 2051. Um, what's happening with land use and how could we project land use ahead and how could we think about levers to influence land use change and hence with the change in land use, a change in the provision of some important ecosystem services. So we were focused on carbon, we were focused on habitat for various uh, species, and we were focused on agriculture and uh, agricultural crop and timber production. So not a complete set of, uh, of services by any means, but an important set. Um, so we were looking at how has land use changed, and one of the things actually that just, just to kind of important note is um, land use change really depends, um, if you're looking kind of at how it has changed in the past, it depends on um, relative prices. So we've looked at two time periods and the changes in land use over uh, uh, these two time periods. So in the 1990s, um, uh, crop prices in you know, were really low. So agriculture prices were really low. We had a lot of land being retired from agriculture. If you project that out into the future, it looks like we're you know, going to continue to uh, have a decline in agricultural uh, land. However, more recently, there was a kind of spike up in agricultural prices. So there was a period of high crop prices the period 2007, 2012, you get a very different picture of kind of the underlying trends of, of what's going on. So we wanted to kind of consider both cases, if you will. And so we, we consider the sort of high agricultural prices and low agricultural prices. And then we wanted to look at a couple of alternative policies to try to shift around the sort of baseline, like what's happening due to market forces, uh, and particularly these agricultural crop um, demand and prices. But if we wanted to try to give incentives to preserve forests, we wanted to try to preserve natural habitats more generally or to contain urban development within uh, current metropolitan areas, how would that affect uh, both land use and then the subsequent flow of ecosystem services? So that's the, that's the analysis that we did. 
Um, we looked at um, uh, these land uses. So we have five kind of collapsing things into five big categories. So crops, pasture, forest, rangeland, and urban. Um, and there's a large data set underneath this. So we had um, the uh, NRI National, Research, uh, National Resource Inventory. Um, and we looked, we basically had an econometric model that looked at how did things change between 1992 and 97 um, as a function of characteristics of, of various parcels. So that's kind of the engine underneath this that's driving the, the land use change. Okay, and then we, as I said, we looked at carbon storage, we looked at timber and, and agricultural production, and we also looked at habitat change. Um, we considered um, a collection of almost 200 species, so 194 species. What kinds of habitat did they need? How much habitat did, uh, you know, what, what counts as habitat? What's their range? Um, in four categories. I'm only gonna talk about um, the bottom two, game species and at-risk birds. Um, the at-risk, you know, so threatened, endangered, or, or species of special concern, those are the ones for which, um, you know, there, there is the further loss of habitat is particularly, um, uh, of, particularly of concern. Okay, so we do this analysis, we run things forward, we look at what happens between our projections between 2001 and 2051, um, and you can see, so obviously if crop prices are low, you're gonna get land coming out of agriculture, so that's the minus 9% there on the left. If you've got uh, high prices, you have land going in, and then I mean, some things there's just a, a, a secular trend out, so less pasture, and if you've got a high demand for crops, you get an even faster decline in, in pasture land. And then you can see, you know, obviously urban is increasing. We have more cities, people are, ex that's expanding. Um, but in general, pasture is declining, rangeland is declining, cities are growing, forests, we tend to be reforesting in the, in the U.S. And then crops depend upon what you think about agricultural production. What does this mean in terms of services? Well, in terms of food production, part of this is driven by land use change. And you can see the difference between you know, if you thought crop prices were low versus high, part of this, you know, why do you get these huge increases in production? We have, or at least we have had historically, um, increases in yield, right? So there's been a, a long-term secular trend of increasing production per, uh, per acre. Um, we're basically, if, if this continues, if that uh, trend continues, you can see that most of the increase is basically due to kind of changes in yield, not changes in, in land use. Those were really small. These are really large changes in, in yield. Carbon storage, when, with the increase in forest, you get an increase in, in biomass carbon stored um, in ecosystems. Soils, uh, if you're expanding agriculture, you get a release of carbon from soils. And then finally, in, in timber production, we have this increase in forestry, which allows an increase in, uh, in, in forestry products or you know, timber output. Um, okay, so in terms of, of, of birds, we, we actually had, this was um, kind of a puzzle for us. Like, how do we summarize the information about large numbers of species? So you have 194 in four categories. So you, know, you can think about roughly sort of 40, 50 species within each category. And they're doing all different kinds of things. Um, they're not behaving very well. And um, so we chose to represent the changes uh, for the species in terms of how many of the species were losing more than 10% of their habitat, how many of them were gaining more than 10% of the habitat, and how many were kind of you know, in between there, not a, a large trend uh, either way. So you can see what happens. Most actually have a uh, little change in, in habitat, but the at-risk birds, there are a number of species of at-risk birds that lose more than 10% of their habitat. So what's interesting to us is you know, we didn't know what patterns we would get, but generally on the ecosystem service side of things, we were doing okay. I mean, we were getting carbon sequestration, the food production was going up and so forth. But for the species, we are continuing to lose habitat. Um, and for the most at-risk species, that's uh, showing up. Uh, you know, that's the largest uh, trend. 
So then we, we the, the other thing we wanted to do with this analysis was ask, well, how can we change this? You know, can we affect the outcome? So we considered three policies, one which paid people to uh, plant trees and keep trees, so uh, forest incentive, one that was um, uh, trying to preserve uh, natural habitat, so it could be forest, but it also could be uh, grasslands, um, and then one that was containing, uh, containing urban areas. And you can see the effect. So this is the change relative to those cases that I said before. So if we put on, for example, the incentive for forest, you get a lot more land coming into forest relative to without that policy, and it's coming out of almost all of the other um, sectors. So certainly crop, um, it's coming out of range and coming out um, of pasture. And similarly for the other uh, two, two strategies. What does this mean in terms of services? Well, if you've got more forest, you will tend to have more carbon storage. You also tend to have more timber production, but less food production, right? There are these trade-offs. Um, and if you do things for uh, native habitat, it's actually not good particularly for any of these uh, ecosystem services. And if you contain cities, actually what happens is you tend to be good for all services because you're getting kind of more rural land, you're getting both more cropland and more forests. Um, what happens for species? Here it's interesting. Um, let's just look at the at-risk birds. So the purple one, you get a decline in the number of species that are losing habitat or for which there's no change, and a big increase in the number of species that are gaining habitat relative to no policy. So the point here is if you target these policies, you can in fact have some impact. Um, but one of the things that was a little bit um, uh, sobering for us um, is just how large these kind of secular changes are. So land use change um, here and the underlying drivers of land use change. You can design tar uh, targeted policies which will do certain things uh, for certain ecosystem services, but you can't, um, you, you can't have it all. We didn't find any policies that gave us all of them uh, simultaneously. Okay, I want to get to China. So I want to I talk about several examples of doing natural capital and ecosystem services in China. Um, China in the modern period has not had as long of a um, history of conservation, but I think one of the kind of like in silent, silent spring in the United States in the, in the early 60s, the Yangtze River flood in 1998 was really a wake up call in China. So um, it was a huge flood, uh, thousands of people lost their lives, huge amount of property damage, um, and shortly after that, um, you know, the Chinese government got serious about we need to do large-scale conservation to help with flood mitigation, uh, other problems of, of soil erosion and uh, habitat provision and water quality, uh, sandstorm prevention. So, you know, so some of these problems, you know, if you've been to China, uh, you know that there are serious air and water problems still. But um, from the top on down, so President Xi Jinping announced that the goal in China would be to become the ecological civilization of the 21st century. Okay, so a grand goal. Um, not just can we improve water quality somewhat but we want to be the ecological civilization of the 21st century. Um, so one of the famous quotes is, clear waters and lush mountains are gold and silver. We will not trade them for gold or silver. So strong statements from the very top about the importance of natural capital um, and, uh, and the environment more generally in China. Um, so, we have been fortunate, we meaning the Natural Capital Project, um, have been fortunate to work closely with colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, unlike the US National Academy of Sciences, like it's great to be a member of the National Academy of Sciences, but basically it's a pat on the back, 
uh, Chinese national, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Academy works with the government on projects that the government deems of high importance in China. <laughs> so they're tasked with doing real work. You know, we're like this honor society. They do real stuff. Um, no, there are, you know, there, there are committees. So the National Research Council, part of the National Academies, does a lot of reports and so forth. But um, as I say, but the, you know, if you work with colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, oftentimes they're working very closely with the government on high priority things. So, for example, uh, the, our colleagues have been tasked with thinking about where and how much to protect. Um, how can we secure nature and worry about poverty alleviation and providing livelihoods? And how can we move beyond GDP as a metric for performance and thinking about incorporating ecological measures of performance? So under this first, this notion of where and how much to protect, so China has initiated uh, what are called ecosystem function conservation areas, or EFCAs. Um, our colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences were in, very influential um, in, in figuring out where to put these and for what reason. Like, is this for flood control or is it for habitat protection uh, or for water resources um, and, or for sandstorm control? And so you can see these are places on the ground in China which have been, uh, which, for which the government has said the primary goal of management in these areas is actually for ecosystem functions. Not for agriculture, it's not for urban development. The primary goal in these areas is to provide these ecosystem services. Okay, um, they've also set up a new national park system. So they've always had a set of kind of ecological reserves or nature reserves, but now they're gonna have a system of national parks. Where should the national parks be? Where should ecological reserves be? Um, it's remarkable, but at least on paper, about, you know, it's 49%, you know, roughly half the land in China has been designated as having a primary function, the preservation of natural capital and the provision of ecosystem services. I cannot imagine half of the United States being set up for that purpose. Okay. Um, Burrowing down into particular areas, you know, how do, how are there going to be programs that both alleviate poverty, provide livelihoods, and provide for the protection of natural capital, provision of ecosystem services? So this is um, a picture of Miyun Reservoir, which is uh, north and east of Beijing, and it is the only surface water supply for Beijing. Beijing is in a dry area. North China is dry. South China is quite wet. But uh, water supply for Beijing and other northern Chinese cities is uh, uh, things are scarce. And so taking care of this watershed and this reservoir is, is, is of great importance. Um, one of the things that they did, they tried a program of payment for ecosystem services in this watershed. They were paying farmers to get out of paddy rice. Paddy rice, very, uh, you know, there's a lot of water, obviously, a lot of nutrients. It flushes a lot of nutrients into the, into the streams, which ends, ends up in the reservoir, which then downstream Beijing has to figure out how to clean up or deal with. Um, so what did they do instead? For someone who comes from the Midwest, whose bane of existence is expansion of corn, agriculture, they went into corn, but corn compared to rice is a good deal. Corn in the Midwest compared to almost anything else is not a good deal. So I had to get over my like inherent uh, notions here. But anyway, uh, we evaluated this program, you know, how much did farmers change their behavior? What was the impact then on water quality? What impact did this have on the livelihoods of farmers and their income? Very interesting. Um, project and they're doing many of these kinds of projects across China. Um, they have paid two, approximately 200 million people are being paid at least part of their income to restore natural capital. I mean, it's just staggering the size of these uh, programs. And I have no idea what the llama is doing in that picture. Um, okay, so. Uh, 
What about um, this last notion of, of or you know, one of these notions of, can, you know, how, um, so the government was interested in how have their investments in natural capital paid off? So can we see that following that big influx of, of conservation payments following the 1998 flood, has there been an improvement in ecosystem services from investing in this, in this natural capital? So this is a paper led by our, our colleague, uh, Liang Zihun at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, published in, uh, two years ago in Science. Um, so the context here is, you know, again, there's been, there's been a, a large number of programs, uh, huge scale across all of China. What has been the impact? What, what benefits has China received from this investment? Um, so we wanted to uh, you know, understand that. Um, our Chinese colleagues have collected information. Uh, there's a Chinese ecosystem assessment, kind of like the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. They are tasked with kind of tracking underlying ecological statistics. There's a large number of statistics. So, for example, there are you know, satellite images and on-the-ground field surveys and records of bio. Again, the scale of all of these things is sort of staggering. Uh, for us, it was wonderful. There's a huge base of information on which to um, basically do models of ecosystem services. I would love to say that we could directly measure these ecosystem services. For the most part, they were not directly measured, so we're modeling. Um, like how much soil erosion would you expect if you had done these kinds of practices in these places? So if you, if you under the sloping lands conversion program, you put land into um, perennial vegetation rather than uh, annual crops, what could you expect as a difference in the amount of um, erosion uh, or how fast would water um, run off? Obviously, these models that we use are built and, and from or use uh, the studies that we have in China to calibrate them, but they're still modeled as opposed to actually measured um, output. Okay. Still, it's, it's, it's impressive how much um, they are doing, and actually going forward, they are doing a lot of modeling. So we used uh, this, the INVEST models for integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs uh, to do this. We looked at everything from food production to carbon to habitat for biodiversity, flood, and so forth. So we looked at, at this set of, um, of seven outcomes. Okay, and the results, uh, so we could plot this over all of China and look at what changed between 2000 and 2010. Whoops, sorry. Um, uh, so, air, you know, we could, we could show where were areas of, of high carbon sequestration, for example. Obviously, it's more in the areas of forest. Where is the food production happening? Where is soil erosion happening? Where are important areas for... Uh, water retention for sandstorm prevention and, and so forth. So you, you can see that. And, and we did that for 2000 when we had data, and we also did it for 2010. And then we looked at the change. And what was interesting is, again, like in the US, most of the ecosystem services were actually showing an improvement. So for the Chinese government, you know, this was, a, this was good news that their investments to change land use to try to preserve natural capital was showing up as an improvement in, um, in the provision of these ecosystem services. So all of the things, flood, uh, excuse me, food production, carbon sequestration, soil retention, sandstorm prevention, water retention, flood mitigation, all of those measures improved over this time period from 2000 to, to 2010. What did not improve, just like in the US, was uh, protecting habitat for biodiversity. So oftentimes, and Taylor knows this well, I mean, the, the story is we're going to, one of the, if you're interested in biodiversity protection, one of the ways you could justify that would be say, well, we're gonna do things which are good for people. We're gonna provide for ecosystem service provision. And, um, and, and it has worked, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that biodiversity is also improving at the same time. And in fact, here it's going the opposite way. Okay. How am I doing for time? I'm kind of, I'm kind of about five. Okay. A few more minutes. Good. All right. One last example. So China's embarking on um, this really ambitious project to develop what they call gross ecosystem product, GEP is basically a complementary measure to GDP. So you have an economic measure, you have a more ecologically based measure, but it is parallel in construction to GDP. So it's trying to give kinds of similar types of information, but really looking at what value is nature contributing um, to the economy and to well-being of, of people in China. This is part of a movement that's international. People have talked about the need to move beyond GDP for a long time. There's been a lot of work here at the Gund um, on this. Uh, this is a book back a few years ago, Joe Stiglitz and Marcia Sen, uh, two Nobel Prize winners in economics, it was sponsored by the French government, called Mismeasuring Our Lives, Why GDP Doesn't Add Up. And there is a third author. I always feel sorry for this third. Well, I don't know if I feel sorry for the third author authoring something with two Nobel Prizes. You know, because it's always like well, Stiglitz and Sen and then Fatuzzi. Anyway, but, uh, you know, so there, there's a lot of attention. This UN is working on this. World Bank, a whole bunch of people are, a whole bunch of groups are working on um, trying to come up with uh, measures. So anyway, um, GDP provides, you know, you like it or hate it, it does provide a clear and easily understood sig signal. It is the most, you know, it's a headline number, it is the most widely reported economic statistic and maybe statistic in general. Um, we don't have in the, in the natural capital ecosystem services world or in all of ecology kind of the equivalent clear signal. Okay. Um, so how can we provide something that maybe supplies that headline role? So in China, they're uh, developing and testing this measure of gross ecosystem product. We're right in the middle of this. Uh, now the aim is actually quite ambitious. Um, it's to try to reveal the contributions of ecosystems to the economy and human well-being, uh, to show the connections among regions like upstream and downstream, upwind and downwind and so forth. Um, so what you do upwind affects whether there are dust storms in Beijing um, to provide a basis for compensation, kind of like in water funds. But here, you know, we might pay uh, uh, grazers out in Inner Mongolia to do practices that stabilize soil so that their dust doesn't get windblown and carry into Beijing and other northern Chinese cities. And also to serve as a performance metric for uh, local and provincial government officials. So in China for many years, uh, leaders were basically assessed by how fast is the economy growing? Again, people respond to incentives. So if you give incentives to have your province grow quickly in GDP, things grow quickly. I mean, in China has been extraordinary in terms of its economic growth, but it has had uh, a really poor performance in many aspects of, um, of environment. So the question, you know, the push here now is to say, let's try to even this up. Let's try to get rid of, again, the asymmetry and have both ecological measures and, um, and this GDP kind of straight market uh, measures being reported. So GDP will be reported alongside GDP. Okay. Um, so to do this, uh, one part is you actually have to create the natural capital accounts on which uh, ecosystem services, which are the flow of benefits, um, accrue. This they are committed to doing, the Chinese government. Every five years, they're going to undertake a Chinese uh, ecosystem assessment. Um, once you have that, you need to be able to translate this into the flows of goods and services, either measured directly or modeled the way we did it in that uh, paper I just talked about. You need to have a way of valuing these ecosystem goods and services, so pricing them. Um, and I'll emphasize that step for just a moment. One way of doing all of this accounting is not to put things in monetary terms, but to leave them in uh, ecosystem accounts or biophysical accounts. And you can certainly do that. Some of the accounting in the UN is going that route. 
um, the people we were working with in China said, no, we really want you to the extent possible to report this in monetary terms so we can use this. If you report things in non-monetary terms, it will get used less. Not that it is useless, but it will be used less often. <laughs> so there's a real push here, and there's a tension here, because frankly, doing this well in monetary terms, some things we can do quite well, some things it is a stretch. Um, and so, you know, practice will evolve, and we can talk about it. But uh, anyway, I'll just very briefly talk about Qinghai Province, a, a province in uh, western China, up on the Tibetan Plateau, high, for the most part, very dry grassland. But it is the water tower of Asia because it's the headwaters of the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, and the Mekong River. Um, so this water tower of Asia, you would think that what they do for, for water is going to be really important. Um, it's, a, it's a place where there is a lot of degraded, overgrazed grasslands. There are also many endangered species. So it's not strictly a, a play for water, but there are uh, a, a number of important conservation objectives here. Um, we looked at a set of ecosystem goods and services to put into our GEP accounting. The obvious ones are provisioning goods, um, so timber, you know, forest products, and fisheries, cro agricultural crops, um, animals. We spent a lot of time uh, sussing out what are called regulating services, so water supply, water quality, soil retention, sandstorm prevention, and you can see the list. These are things for which it's really important and largely right now they are invisible. So the provisioning goods actually show up by and large in GDP already. So when there's a problem in agriculture, that's known. When there's a problem in sandstorm prevention, you know, yeah, there's a sandstorm in Beijing, but what can you do to stop it? You know, what actions do you take? Well, this is really trying to get at the kind of underlying conditions that give rise to these uh, issues in regulating services. So carbon, uh, air and water purification, uh, flood prevention, and so on. Um, and then we would love to have a long list of cultural goods and services. We have one. So we're starting with one, ecotourism, we can do that, but um, in IPBES, uh, the, the intergovernmental uh, platform, there's huge arguments uh, and huge debates about the importance of cultural services and how can we accurately um, describe them. So that's an area where I hope that you know, five years from now, giving a talk like this, we'll have a longer list of, of reasonable things to say about that. Okay, I'm not gonna say much about the we can do this for provisioning services. This is pretty straightforward. For the most part, there are good statistics already. You can look at the change here we did between 2000 and 2015. Mostly it's going up, both in terms of monetary values and in terms of biophysical values. Um, I wanted to talk very shortly about water because it's hugely important here. So it, you know, how is water that originates in Qinghai, how is it used downstream? So irrigation, hydropower, industrial and domestic use. So, uh, and then, you know, there are various ways then of factoring what the values of those are. So what, oops, sorry, what is the value that you get from downstream hydropower production? Like, well, it's the amount or the share of water that's attributable back to Qinghai and um, what is the value of that electricity that's created from the hydropower from that particular dam? Okay, so you can do similar kinds of things for irrigation, for industrial and domestic uh, use. Actually, water prices in China are actually less distorted than they are in the U.S. You can actually use them for exercises like this, which was a very pleasant surprise. You could not do a similar thing in the U.S. on that. Um, so we went through this exercise and did this for all of those services and gave it our best attempt to do both the biophysical values and the monetary values. We also did this for ecotourism. And then you can sum this all together. And one of the interesting points for us, to date people have paid attention to provisioning services because it's easy. You can do that. Regulating services by and large have not been valued 
Um, they've not been quantified and not been valued. But if you look at the monetary values, the major, you know, that is the largest category is coming up in regulating services. So I don't know that it's measured very precisely, which I'm pretty sure it's not, but the magnitude, the point is that it is a large source of value and currently it has largely been ignored. So what do I take of this? The importance of regulatory services, even though these things are really hard to do, it is worth the effort to try to improve the results here. A large share of the value in Shanghai comes from water supply. That shouldn't be a surprise as it's called the water tower of Asia, but not accounting for these regulatory services, you'd largely ignore this. Um, provisioning services uh, are easier to measure, but not where the bulk of value comes in. So in terms of kind of what lessons to learn from this exercise and more generally, um, you know, this will take time. We're still, we're somewhere between the Wild West period and things actually starting to settle down and become more systematic. Um, it will take a little bit of time, and especially if this is going to be bought into by the UN system, so, you know, the people who are uh, in control of the statistical accounts that countries do, they tend to be rather conservative and you have to prove that you're up to your, you know, that you can do this as well as the people who do GDP. Um, Chinese government is, is committed and they really want to integrate this into their decision making. And if China does it again, it doesn't just stay in China. China is a role model for many other countries. Um, one note, GEP is a statistic just like GDP is a statistic and it does not tell you everything that you want to know. In particular, it doesn't tell you much about sustainability. You can overfish and have a large harvest today with the consequence of having poor harvests in the future. So you need to complement GEP with measures of natural capital and have non-declining measures of natural capital in order for you actually be thinking about sustainability. Um, so GEP is not the same as sustainable development. Um, and that, um, uh, you know, so, so we, as I said, we need to have trends in natural capital um, as well. And then um, it's a use, GEP is a useful complement. I mean, having the Chinese government is, is really, um, wants this, they don't want to be reliant just upon these economic measures that they have now. Um, there is, however, you can't just add GEP and GDP. They are complementary measures. There is overlap. There are things that show up in both, like uh, crop production, but there are things in GEP that just do not show up in GDP that are invisible in GDP. So it's important to expand our set of metrics to include uh, the values of nature that currently don't, that don't show up. So finally, one of the things that really struck me is, is thinking about when did GDP and basically the economic accounts, what was the, what was the spark? Well, the spark was the Great Depression. So people had been playing around with economic accounts and wouldn't it be great, but it was really the Great Depression that pushed governments to say, we are flying blind. We need to have a set of macroeconomic performance metrics. Shouldn't the great degradation of natural capital now be the spark that says we need to have better ecological measures? We need to know what's happening in nature. So in the 21st century, we're not flying blind anymore into the, into the future. I know it's kind of long, but with that, let me stop and see if there are any questions. Thanks very much. Yeah. 
and and kind of how that plays into these decisions that are probably at the local level that then kind of maybe you know get aggregated. Um, and, and these decisions are kind of you know have that tension around kind of like yep. promoting local growth. Yeah, that's a it's a great question. In China, as I learned, I'm certainly not uh, expert um, on this, but um, actually, there's a Chinese proverb that I love. It's like the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. You know, so uh, the central government might say we're doing this, but like, what happens on the ground? Um, so there's a really interesting um, difference between the efforts that I talked about. Um, uh, ecological function conservation areas, which are kind of decreed from on high, like we will set aside these areas, and that's you know zoning, and it's done um, from Beijing outward. But there's another policy which I didn't talk about, which is called redlining. And redlining is up to the local officials. So there, there's a so these ecological redlining, and and so within the kind of redlined areas. Uh, there's supposed to be protection uh, of various degrees, but it's you know there's a, uh, a presumption that there's going to be kind of an ecological orientation. But the local government, local officials get to choose what areas go inside of the ecological red line and what go out of the ecological red line. And so part of this was this kind of realization of the tension. It's like it can't all of these things can't come down from above, or they're going to get from below, and also they don't have enough to actually like monitor, not enough resources to monitor everywhere. So um, this was a, a, you know, so it's interesting. So I, I spent, you know, six months trying to figure out, wait a minute, we've got these EFCAs, and then now there's this redlining, and how do these like match up? Because they're both seem to be trying to do the same thing, which is to get at the, you know, what are areas where conservation objectives are, are important? But the real difference, as I said, is one is more top down, the other is bottom up, bottom up. So the only thing is, the central government is saying is, here's your goal for your province. You have to set aside you know, so much of your land, I don't know, whatever, 10, 20%, or 40%. But you choose. So the only thing you have to tell us is, in the end, that you know, the areas that you've chosen add up to the total. It's, it's bubbling up. The property, I, I am not this, but I'm going to kind of dodge that one for the most part. I, I'm still sort of trying to figure out this, you know, and it's like, okay, well, you get to use the land and you're kind of leasing this, but it's not really yours, it's the government's. And what does that really mean in practice? Anyway, I mean, I, it's, it's really interesting. I wish I could answer it better. I'll leave it at that. Some of the early work Valuing ecosystem services included crop wild relatives. It's fairly easy to put a number on it. China has immense crop wild relative resources, some of the very best. If you added in those numbers or, or tried, I know there that Nigel Max did in the UK work with the Chinese group yeah. to do some of that work. I'm curious to see where the where how those would affect the numbers. It's a great point. Um, not have that in the current versions. So my view of this in general is that this is kind of the first pass. We're trying to do this in a systematic way, but we're going to have, you know, for every ecosystem service that we actually do today, we'll probably have five, ten in you know, ten years' time. That's a really good suggestion. I will keep that uh, in the back of my mind. I love the suggestion of who it is who's already started to assemble this information, because yeah. that's the other <laughs> part. So, yeah, it's great. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions, and then let me choose which one you want to answer. Oh, good. Do you want my modeling and ecological theory question, or my economics and policy question? Go for it. Right. I don't know. Model. OK. So um, in general, it seems like it that you have to your models are sort of a land um, sparing versus land sharing mentality as ecologists think about it. And I'm, I'm curious to hear, one, have, have you thought about 
models that would better incorporate either practices or um, you know, ways that agriculture is used in concert with forest conservation, habitat preservation, et cetera, as opposed to food production is here and forest is there. Um, and if so, how do you think your results might change or do you plan on moving some of your modeling in that direction in the future? Yeah, so some of the stuff we've done, particularly in Minnesota, it's, it's, it's a very good observation. And some of the early work was like, yes, it's, you know, it's put stuff down, it's one thing or the other. Like the stuff in the US, it's like, it is one of five things, and that's it. Uh, work that we've done, or local work, so stuff we've done, for example, in Minnesota, we actually are incorporating, like, did you do, you know, a cover crop? Did you do tillage, you know, what were your tillage practices? When did you put on the fertilizer, and how much? So, exactly this notion of, it's not just corn, it's what did you do in terms of management? Conceptually, it's not a problem. We can think of that instead of saying, I have a block of land that's called corn, I actually have a block of land which is called corn with conservation tillage, with this level of nitrogen and phosphorus application and so forth. So our limit really is not, I mean, it's not conceptually difficult to get in the practices as opposed to just the land use. And increasingly we are doing that because it's really important in certainly in agriculture, but almost anything else. So the only the only limitation is um, do you have a good sense of like what it does? So you know we spend a lot of time in the work in Minnesota figuring out if you put in these buffers along streams, what is the evidence for how it changes, how much of that, how much of the nutrients actually gets into the stream versus being portion. So in principle, it's not, I say this a lot in this world, in principle, I know how to do this. In practice, do we have the actual evidence to say something reasonable about putting it into, uh, into the things? Um, on the Minnesota stuff, where we did the best practices, um, the current set of best practices, we, so we were trying to get the, that analysis, we were trying to get to um, meet TMDLs, which required roughly uh, Seventy percent reduction in phosphorus and sediment. Uh, you know, huge. We're only going to make it. But even getting to, you know, so we said, okay, well, let's follow the recommended best practices. How much of a reduction do we get? Ten percent. I mean, you know, it was. We were not getting close to the kinds of objectives for water quality that were being said, just using some of these best management practices. It's like. You have to retire some land, especially in key places with tiny and long Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, just a couple more questions. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. 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 So my question is going to come at it from the kind of demand side, the beneficiary side. And so we've seen this like rampant ability for China to kind of conserve and restore where these functions and services are supplied. And I wonder if you've seen evidence for sort of similar top-down interest in controlling where those ecosystem services thinking of how we just have these cities kind of popping up. And so are they going to take into this yeah. kind of, well, take into account this ecosystem service and GDP thinking into kind of future urban development? Yeah, it's a good question. So when you, when you first started, I was like, gosh, I don't know how to answer. But um, I'll give you one anecdote, uh, which is not tremendously encouraging. So I'm going to start on a more positive note. I guess I will start on a more positive note, which is, you know, they're, they zone everything. So there's no such thing as like unplanned urban sprawl. You can still have planned urban sprawl, but it's not, you know, it's it, things are zoned. Okay, so in general, the Chinese government is more, in, in some sense, it's rational. It says, you know, give us, that's why they keep coming to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, like tell us like what are the consequences of doing it this way versus that way. Okay, so that's the plus side. The minus side is, um, so they're building a new city 
that can take the strain off of Beijing. Um, and um, so where did they locate this new city? They located this new city in a place where if you were taking seriously the kinds of urban ecosystem services like what's the flood risk here in particular, you probably would not have put the city where they put the city. So, you know, why did it get located there? I don't know the ins and outs of things, but, you know, it's in some ways like people everywhere. You know, somebody is the big promoter of this, and, you know, it's maybe it's not monetary, but it's uh, like an ego thing. I, I don't really know the story, but they ended up putting the city not in a place which is that sensible from the point of view of what's happening to nature or what are going to be the benefits or costs to the city when it floods. So. Steve, we have um, time for one more question, and this gentleman had a question earlier, so we okay. pass the mic here, but encourage everybody to stay for a reception just right next door to continue the conversation with Steve and Taylor and yourselves. And Okay. So um, I thought that the China example was really interesting because I know and, and read a lot of people make a lot of hay about how the concept of valuing ecosystem services is sort of connected with like capitalism and commodification. And of course, China's not like a fully planned commodity um, economy, but it's a it's a partially planned one. And and it all seemed to me as if this concept of valuing ecosystem services kind of works best and makes the most sense within the Chinese context. And so can, I wonder if you could kind of sort of elaborate how this has changed your thinking or how you've tried to change other people's thinking about this concept where it seems to be, what, based on it seeming to fit so well within the context of a semi-authoritarian, semi-planned economy yep. um, compared to the situation so the main answer I would give to you, there's actually, we could talk about this for a long time, but the main answer that I would give to you on this is most ecosystem services which are currently underprovided, in economic terms, they are public goods, right? So, you know, it's really hard to have somebody in the free market economy have an incentive to do what's necessary to continue to provide them. And that's what we've seen decline. In China, what you have to do is you have to convince the leaders that this is a public good, which is not hard to do because most of these are public goods. So you convince the leaders that this is in the best interest of the citizens of China, largely speaking, and the government will take actions to help provide those public goods. They'll set up these big programs like the Sloping Lands Conversion Program, and they will fund them well. You know, here we have these programs, and there is, you know, we talk about providing some level of public goods, but they're shrinking, and they will continue to shrink with this current administration. Um, and we're going to get a large underprovision of these things. It's really hard. Here we've got this market mythology, like that the free market will supply all goods. Free markets do really well at supplying private goods. You know, those things that are non-rival and not, you know, the, <laughs> that have those elements to them, and non-excludable and non-rival. But um, in China, you don't have to like pass that market test. You have, to, you, have to, you have to be able to convincingly say, this is going to improve the well-being of citizens of China, broadly speaking. And then you have a shot at getting things um, done. So, you know, after the flood in 98, they recognized, the leaders generally recognized that it was really important to protect watersheds and protect the natural capital. So yeah, it, you know, I kind of joke with people, it's, and it's not really a joke, it's like, it is easier to do a lot of this work right now in China than it is to do here in the US. Okay, so once again, you've heard it several times, but next door, let's please continue, and, but for now, please join us.